Welcome to the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. My name is Leon. Let's talk a little bit about what I learned at Oshkosh 2019 and some plans for upcoming videos based on what I learned at Oshkosh. Before I left for Oshkosh, I had been editing a video that was a summary of the process that I used for resin infusion of the carbon fiber samples that I had been making. While I was at Oshkosh, I learned quite a few more things about resin infusion, and I decided that video I was working on wasn't adequate. So at some point in the future, I will reshoot that video and post it. But I learned a whole lot of new things while I was at Oshkosh, and I thought I'd give you a little summary of some of the things that I learned. If you've been following the videos on this channel, you'll know that I had a little trouble with my early resin infusions. I just could not get the weave filled on the mold side of my samples. And I played around, I played around, and I finally found something that worked, which was to use two layers of insect screen as my flow media. One of the things that I learned from the Russ Imanis workshop at Oshkosh was that Home Depot or Lowe's shade cloth makes an interesting flow media. So I'll be doing a video here before too long testing that out and see how it works. By the way, most of the things that I learned at Oshkosh was at the Russ and Manis workshop. And if you want to find out more about Russ, he's got a Facebook page called Advanced Composite Infusion. Look him up. Now, another thing that he mentioned, I did not get a chance to quiz him more about it, but he said that surface tension on your mold surface can also cause a little bit of trouble with pinholes and not getting that mold surface infused with epoxy. And one of the things that you can do to help reduce that surface tension of your epoxy as it's trying to flow through is to rough up the surface of your mold. Now, what I wanted to ask him is how rough are we talking and I didn't get a chance to do that. So I'll make a video doing some experiments and we'll find out. One thing that I had noticed in a few of my experiments is that spread toe, even though it's stronger per weight than things like plain weave or two by two twill cloth, is that epoxy does not like to penetrate through spread toe cloth. So if you had multiple layers of spread toe, you're gonna to have a lot of trouble getting your epoxy to penetrate. So one of the things that you can try is to combine the spread toe with a cloth that lets epoxy spread a little easier, for example, a 2x2 two two twill. That's worth a try. One of the things I learned that when you're using a foam core, especially the thinner foam core, let's say eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch, so about three millimeters up to about six millimeters, if you're using a divinyl cell, H45, the final weight, once you've done your infusion, will be almost the same as if you had used H80. And by the way, that's basically the difference in density. So the 45 is about half as dense as the H80. And the reason for that is the H45 cells are bigger than the H80 cells. That means the surface of an H45 piece of foam will absorb more epoxy than the surface of the H80. And of course, H80 has far better physical characteristics, in other words, has better shear strength than H45. So I'm gonna do an experiment, we're gonna verify that. One thing I had not noticed and had not known is when you're cleaning off mold release with acetone, you'll frequently leave behind a little bit of residue. And then you've gotta clean up that residue and you use alcohol to clean that up. And that's going to be useful in the future when I'm getting ready to prep my carbon fiber surfaces to be painted. Now something that Russ mentioned that I hadn't heard before and I think is interesting. When you're laying up cloth in your mold, you work from the leading edge of your mold to the trailing edge of your mold. When you do that, then the overlaps are a certain way. So if this is your leading edge, then when you go to put the next piece on after that, it'll overlap like this. Now, I didn't get a chance to ask him for the rationale for that, but I think that was interesting. Something that I had noticed in some of my samples that I've been making, and I don't believe I have shown any videos of it yet, is that on a couple of these sandwich panels I've made using eighth inch foam, 
Well, I've been pulling out the peel ply. It has been pulling very, very hard, and I've been concerned that I'm going to end up peeling my carbon fiber off of my foam core. And also on some of these really thin laminates I've been making, which is just two ply of the 2x2 twill, uh, 200 grams per square meter, they bend quite a bit when I'm trying to pull out the peel ply, and I'm concerned that I'm fracturing the epoxy when I'm doing that. Well, one of the things that Russ mentioned, and it makes sense, is instead of using plain peel ply, use a peel ply that has a little bit of release agent added to it. And so we'll do an experiment, seeing how well that works. Now, one of the issues you have with that, though, is that you're likely to leave a little bit of that release agent behind when you pull the peel ply. So if you want a bond line where some of that peel ply is, wherever you want a bond line, you really need to use the peel ply that does not have a release agent. Another thing that I learned that makes a lot of sense is when you have a sandwich with a foam core, that if you have a cut off edge like this one, and I'll give you a close up view, what you want to do is make sure that you wrap that edge with a little bit of carbon fiber. And it doesn't have to be a whole lot, but what you want to do is to make sure that this, neither one of these faces can peel off your core. Now, even if you put this let's say it's a fuselage bulkhead up to his skin and you tab it in. If you haven't wrapped this edge, you can still get some delamination from your core. So we'll be doing that. One thing that I've learned I really need to do is to do a better job of protecting my vacuum bag when I pull the vacuum on it. And by protecting it, I mean preventing pin hole leaks from occurring when I pull the vacuum. And there's a couple things that we can do easily right off the bat to help with that. One is to make sure that spiral tubing is always wrapped in peel ply. It can be pretty easy for a vacuum bag to get pinched in between the spirals on the spiral tubing and to cause a leak. Another thing is on the ends of the spiral tubing, put a little bit of piece of tape on that end because there is a sharp corner where that's cut and a little bit of masking tape to cover over that can help protect the vacuum bag from getting poked with that little sharp corner on the spiral tubing. So those are some changes I'm gonna make with the way I do my layups. And there's more things I learned in the workshop that I'll be doing some future videos on. For example, making plugs, making molds, and better processes for doing the vacuum infusion. So the next few videos will cover things like the horizontal design for the UWS-1 ultralight airplane. And I'm going to be doing some more tests with flow media. I have some ideas on testing various kinds of commercial flow medias and some unconventional flow medias. So look forward to those videos.